Hi, thank you so much for uh, making your purchase of the DVD. Hopefully this teaching is going to be beneficial to you, uh, as, especially as beneficial as it has been to me as I've discovered healing theology. Uh, you know, it, it, my understanding of healing theology, I, you could say it started when I was a kid. I was born and raised in a Pentecostal church. Uh, we, were, we, were, we were taught that God wants to heal. The tricky thing is I never saw people getting healed. I mean, I, I had been healed many times. When I was a baby, I was healed of a heart murmur. Um, when I got a little older, I was healed of, of gosh, tendonitis. I, I used to have scars on my face from second degree burns. Um, I was healed of degenerative disc disease in my back uh, that I had had for four years, bulging discs as well. And um, God set me free. But in the midst of all that, me being set free, I would pray for people to be healed and nothing would happen. Which, uh, you know, if you're anything like me, that's incredibly frustrating. Especially when you look at the Bible, you look at the book of Acts, you look at the ministry of Jesus, and then you start looking at these other ministers and they're doing it and you're going, what am I missing here? You know, it's interesting, uh, I had two people, one of whom was my own grandmother on her deathbed, prophesy over me, you're going to have a healing ministry. And I'm thinking, boy, you know, grandma's on a lot of medication and that other lady probably ate some bad pizza because frankly, I'm praying for people to be healed and nothing's happening, right? Well, that's when uh, God started really opening things up for me. Uh, I, I heard one particular preacher, his name was Todd White, and he was saying, it was just a YouTube video, and, and what he said, it shook me to the core. He said, Jesus said in Mark 16, these signs will accompany those who believe. And then he filled it in, speaking in new tongues, uh, lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. And when he said, these signs will accompany those who believe, therefore, if these signs don't accompany you, there must be something up with your belief. Well, that just made me mad. That made me mad. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm raised in the Assemblies of God Church. I'm a Pentecostal. You know, I believe in divine healing. You can't tell me that I don't believe right and that that's the reason the signs don't accompany me, right? Well, it put me on this little quest. I, I was so upset that I decided I can do one of two things here. I can totally blow off what this guy said and ignore the fact that he's out there healing the sick. <laughs> or I can actually assume that there might be something to it and investigate. And uh, isn't that what the Bereans did in the book of Acts? It says that they searched the scriptures to prove Paul true, that what he was saying was true. So what I did, I dropped everything. Every, every podcast, every book I was reading, every video I was watching, anything from anybody that the person wasn't doing the stuff, I shut it out of my life for three months. And I only read the Bible. Uh, I read teachings from, from people in the, in the past like Smith Wigglesworth and John G. Lake, people in the present like Bill Johnson, Todd White, David Hogan, these, these people who just they are living the life of a ministry of the supernatural. Three months, I, I poured myself into that kind of a study. And what I discovered at the end of it was also frustrating. I had been told these signs accompany those who believe. And so if they don't accompany you, there's something up with your belief. And what I found was that none of these guys had an identical healing or an identical theology to any of the others. There were so many differences. I, I mean, they, they, you, you couldn't even, if you put them all together, they couldn't form a denomination. Let's just put it that way. There was so much diversity. And so I was, even, I was even more frustrated because here I'm like, well, they don't even believe the same thing, but they're doing the stuff. I believe differently. Why can't I do the stuff? And that's when the first key really clicked. The key was this. When Jesus said these signs will accompany those who believe, he didn't mean believe the right theology. It's not about what you believe, it's about who you believe. So when I discovered that it was all about believing Jesus, boom, things opened up. I actually, uh, I did find one common thread throughout all those healing ministers, throughout the history, throughout present. The common thread was simply this. Every one of them was absolutely convinced that the atonement of Jesus, the price he paid at his crucifixion, paid for all forgiveness and all healing. That was consistent through all of them. Uh, I mean, we've got scriptures where forgiveness and healing are paired together over and over and over again. All the way from the New Testament where you've got, uh, you know, the paralytics lowered through the roof to Jesus and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And then he says, to prove I have the authority, rise up and walk. 
That's kind of a loose connection, but what about in the book of James where it says, is any one of you sick? He should call to the elders of the church to pray for him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Yeah. Where did the forgiveness thing come from? We were talking about sickness, right? Even in the Old Testament, Psalm 103 says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then he starts to list these benefits. And I think it's in verse 3. He says, Who heals, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Isaiah, when he prophesied about Jesus, he said that, you know, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement needful to obtain peace for us was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Jesus paid the price. And when I settled that in my heart, that Jesus paid the price, no questions asked, and I, have, I, I can know him. And I, if I will believe him, these signs will accompany me. Uh, things started to change. So I was a youth pastor at the time and I decided, you know what? I'm going to preach this. So I go to my youth group. I, I preached my heart out. God wants to heal and he wants to use you to do it. And of course, at the end, I opened things up. I, I, I said, if we're going to get into groups of three, four, five students and pray for each other, if someone has a need, if no one in your group has a need, just think of somebody, surely somebody has an aunt with cancer or something, you're going to pray. All right. So I, I, I set them loose. But of course, I stood back because God still had never used me to minister healing. So uh, even though I was convinced that he wanted to do it, I still didn't have that faith to step out and do something yet. So, sure enough, uh, we, we turned things over to the kids and um, there was a, one of our interns, his name was Josh, was with a group of 7th grade boys. And Josh, being an intern, having no income, having no insurance, he had an ear infection that he had let go. Uh, and the problem was it had brought him to a point of almost deafness and excruciating pain in that ear. So uh, he had the boys praying for him. Well, you know, a couple minutes goes by and Josh comes up to me kind of sheepishly and he says, Hey, uh, I feel bad because they prayed for me, nothing happened, what should I do? And I said, I told him what I had seen these other people do, which was, actually it's what Jesus taught in Luke chapter 11. He said, uh, you know, if you're asking for bread for a friend and you keep on asking with persistence, with that shameless audacity, you just keep going at it, you will get the bread you're asking for for your friend. Luke chapter 11, that's a paraphrase, but it's right on the heels of his teaching on prayer, the Lord's Prayer that we're so familiar with. So I said, just ask again. It's what Jesus taught us to do. So he goes back, all the kids pray a second time, nothing happens. This time the seventh grade boys come up to me. They said, Pastor Art, what are we supposed to do? We've tried everything. I said, really? You, you tried everything? They said, oh yeah, yeah, we tried everything. I said, what did you try? They said, well, we, we tried, uh, we, we laid hands on them. We prayed for him, we commanded his ear to be healed, we commanded the infection to go, and it's just not working. I did not have some revelation from God. I didn't have faith in that moment. I honestly, I didn't even expect it to work. But I was just trying to, as a goofy youth pastor, think of something they hadn't tried yet. So I took a few steps forward to where Josh was sitting in the chair. Stuck my, I said, did you try this? And I stuck my finger in his ear and I said, open stepped back and Josh goes, oh my gosh, that worked. And of course I had the same reaction. Oh my gosh, that worked. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm serious. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was the first time I ever saw God heal through me. And that I actually learned something else through that experience. See, healing happens by grace. Jesus didn't say these signs will accompany those who believe if they feel the right feeling, if they think the right thought. He didn't say any if, the only if was if you believe. He said, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. See, I used to lay hands on the sick and as I prayed, trying to find all the right words to pray, uh, as if it was according to me saying the right words to twist God's arm instead of him doing what he's already paid to do, I would, as I would pray, I would even be trying to feel power somehow moving down my arm or, or something, trying to somehow push God's presence into this person I, and, and I would pray hard. And the more intensity I put in it and the more effort I made, the less likely it was to happen. And here I am in this situation where I'm not trying at all. I don't, I'm not even expecting it. to. I'm not even coming with expectation. I'm just trying to be creative. In the setting of that, that's when healing happened. 
And that's when I learned it's not about what I do, it's not about how I say it, what feeling I feel. There's, there's no if other than believe Jesus and lay hands. And even that one is up in the air because as you remember, Jesus had the centurion who, who came, who sent word to Jesus. Uh, the centurion said, my servant is ill. He needs healing. You can heal him. And when Jesus was on his way, the centurion sent word to him saying, whoa, 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 don't come here. Uh, I know you're a man of authority. I'm a man of authority. I'm under authority. And what I say goes. I know you're under the authority of your father and what you say goes. So just, just speak the word and my servant will be made well. And of course, Jesus commended his faith. So, there's the authority side, there's the power side where contact is made and God touches a person like the woman with the issue of blood who touched the hem of Jesus' garment and power went out from him and healed her. So there's, there's two different teals, uh, tools here. In fact, in Luke chapter 9, when Jesus sent out the 12, it says that he sent them, he gave them power and authority to preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, right? Power and authority, two tools for the job. And we have these at our disposal, at our disposal as well. Uh, well, I want to look at healing theology. See, I, what I've given you so far are some stories, some practical tools, but I want to give you the Bible that backs this up. Because I don't want to just believe things about healing that are, frankly, erroneous. I want to find stuff that Jesus believed, things Jesus taught, things Jesus lived, because Jesus is our ultimate example. We're going to go to uh, four basic litmus tests. And if you've heard my, uh, my CD teaching on healing theology, you've heard these before. But I think that they, they bear a lot of weight for this teaching. Uh, four litmus tests for valid healing theology. Number one, it has to agree 100% with the entire Bible. Number two, it has to agree 100% with the example of Jesus. Number three, it has to agree 100% with the nature of God. And number four, it has to work. <laughs> I mean, if it doesn't work, what, what are we here for? So, it's not just, uh, I don't want to just teach you what you should believe. I want to show you what works. And it's all from the Bible. So, without further ado, let's get started. See, it has to first of all agree 100% with the Bible. Uh, Psalm 119 verse 160 says in the New American Standard Bible, The sum of your word is truth. In other words, one little piece of God's word all by itself, out of context, isn't necessarily truth. It's easy to take little chunks out of context and twist them to mean whatever we want them to mean. But if we take the entire counsel of God's word, that's where we discover, yes, this is truth. The sum of it is truth. Uh, so, any theology based on anything other than the entire Holy Bible is no theology at all. Uh, rather, it's nothing more than meaningless opinion and empty speculation. We don't want any of that. So number two, it has to agree 100% with the example of Jesus. He's our prime example for Christian living. Uh, John 14, 12, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. <laughs> so, not only did Jesus say we would do the same things, he said we would do greater things. Now, there are a few schools of thought on this when some people say that by greater, he meant greater in quantity rather than quality, if you will. Um, the only problem with that is that uh, it ignores the cases where people have done truly actually greater works than Jesus. Now, before you think that's blasphemy, let's look at the Apostle Peter in the book of Acts. I think it was chapter 5. As he's walking down the street, the people were bringing out the sick on mats, laying them in the streets so that Peter's shadow would touch them and they'd be healed. Now, I don't read anywhere in the Bible where Jesus' shadow was healing people. But Peter did that. Jesus, people touched the hem of his garment. There are verses that say as many as touched him were healed because power was coming out from him and healing them all. But I don't see anywhere where people were touched by his shadow and they were healed. Now, was Peter being prideful by doing something better than Jesus? Or was Peter simply doing what Jesus said he would do? I'm thinking about people like Reinhard Bonnke who goes into Africa and speaks to a crowd of a million people, which is just unfathomable until you see the pictures. And then from the stage, he says, sickness leave in Jesus' name, blind eyes open in Jesus' name, deaf ears open in Jesus' name. And all across this field, no one was touched, no one even came near his shadow, but all these people receive healings. And I don't see Jesus doing that. 
Now, I, I know that seems uncomfortable, but it's what Jesus said. It's not pride if Jesus told us we would do it. See, the Bible says that Moses was the most humble man who ever lived. And do you know who wrote that book of the Bible? Moses. <laughs> so, if God said to Moses, you're the most humble man who ever lived, and Moses said, no, no, I'm prideful, that in itself is pride because Moses would be exalting his opinion above God's. But if God says you're the most humble man who ever lived and you say, yes, I'm the most humble man who ever lived, that's humility because you are accepting what God says to be true above what your opinion is. And if Jesus said, whoever believes in me is going to do what I've been doing, in fact, he'll do greater works than these, I have to believe Jesus. That doesn't mean I'm being prideful about it. It doesn't mean that I, I have some ego complex or that I, I think that I'm all that. It simply means that I take Jesus at his word, I believe him, and that's humility. So it's very important we believe Jesus. So we have to look at what agrees 100% with the example of Jesus because our lifestyle of healing theology is not only supposed to match his example, but it's supposed to exceed his example. That's exciting. That's very exciting. Uh, the things we read about Jesus' life should be the ground level of our own faith because we're supposed to do greater works than him with the help of the Holy Spirit. Anything less powerful than the example of Jesus is really falling short of what he promised. Anyone who does not see the example of Jesus as the bare minimum to be expected from the Christian life can easily fall victim to bad theology, and that's what we want to avoid. Jesus is the low mark of what's available to us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Number three, it has to agree 100% with the nature of God. Now, this is most clearly understood by observing the nature of Jesus because Jesus came as that perfect representation of the Father. Um, in John 14, 7 through 10, Jesus said, If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father's in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing the work. See, Father God's nature is perfectly revealed in Jesus. If I can't see something in the life of Jesus, I have to reason to question whether or not it truly is in the heart of the Father to do. Uh, there's another verse to this. Uh, in Hebrews 1.3, we find out that Jesus is the exact representation of his being, of the Father's being. So, a misunderstanding of the nature of God gives way to bad theology. <laughs> and the best way to understand the nature of God is to look at the example of Jesus. See, uh, the disciples had a misunderstanding of the nature of God. See, it's true that in the Old Testament, God had to bring destruction because the purpose of the Old Testament was to reveal the truth that sin results in death. God had to prove that to his people in order to show them that there is a better way. So, out of love, God allowed the law to reveal what sin was and prove sin results in death. Over and over it happened. But when Jesus came, here shows up, you know, Luke chapter 9. The disciples go into the Samaritan village and uh, they want to speak in the village. They want to invite Jesus in and the village rejects them. So James and John go to Jesus. They say, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire on them and destroy them? And Jesus says, no! <laughs> he said, the Son of Man does not, did not come to destroy life but to save it. You don't know what spirit you're of. Do you see, Jesus was now showing, this is the heart of the Father. Even though God had to do those things then to deal with sin and prove the law. See, Psalm 119, uh, I think it's verse 75, it talks about God being faithful to his righteous laws. And it says that in faithfulness you've afflicted me. Faithfulness to what? Faithfulness to those righteous laws. See, God was being faithful to the law if he ever brought destruction. But now we live in an era where Jesus has taken the law that stood against us and canceled it, nailing it to the cross. That's what Colossians tells us. So now we live in a very different period of time where Jesus did not come to destroy life. He came to save it. In James 2, uh, we find out about this fourth litmus test. It works, right? James 2 we're shown that it is possible to have faith 
without having action accompanying it. Verse 26 says that faith without works is dead. So, you could have faith, you could believe God, you could have love and trust and all that stuff, but if there's no action to back it up, it's just a dead faith. God wants to bring us life. He wants us walking, living beings who represent Jesus because Jesus is life. He wants us to look like him. So in John 10, 37, Jesus said, Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. Now, can you imagine if that was our motto as the church? Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. And in this case, we would actually defer to Jesus. Do not believe me unless I do what Jesus does. That's what 1 John says. It says, if we claim, anyone who claims to be in him must walk as Jesus walked. It's expected of the believer that we would, our lives would look like Jesus. Imagine what would happen if the church, if, in the church, if Christians got to the point where they said to the unbeliever, don't believe anything I have to say unless I do the works of Jesus. Jesus said in Mark 16, 17 to 18, that miraculous signs like healing the sick will accompany those who believe. And as I said before, that means if these signs don't accompany you, there must be something up with your belief. And that's what we're sorting out here today. Before we go on though, let me note that this fourth measuring rod is, is kind of the weakest of all of them. And here's why that is. Uh, miracles and healings do not in themselves validate a person's theology uh, on their own, okay? Uh, the Bible promises that false Christs, false prophets are going to come and they're going to work lying signs and wonders. So just because miracles are happening in a person's ministry doesn't mean that that person has their theology all sorted out. However, I would also say that if miracles and healings are completely absent from a person's ministry, then that doesn't offer me any kind of tangible proof to trust that what they have to say is true. It may actually be true. That's where it gets dicey. But you see, if, if we would actually walk in the power of God, it would free us from uh, having to argue theology. Instead, we could say, which of these is bearing fruit? I would much rather look at what bears fruit than sit around and argue theology. Frankly, it's just more enjoyable. Uh, just because miracles hap of healing happen in a person's life does not mean that their theology is perfect. However, a complete absence of miracles and healings in a person's life can be taken as evidence that the person's theology of miracles is questionable. So look at your own life. If miracles are never happening, then it's time to dig into the Word of God and discover a healthy theology that works. If your theology is good based on the first three measuring rods, but it still isn't working, here's, here's the key. Try spending more time in prayer and stepping out in faith until something happens. It's not that you're going to earn a ministry of healing. That doesn't work. But what you can do is come to a point of belief, of believing him. And the more time we spend with Jesus, the more clearly we know his heart, the more absolutely we believe him, that's what we're looking for. That's what we're shooting for. See, biblical truth trumps experience. If the Bible says that something is true and I haven't experienced it, I can't base my theology on my lack of experience. I have to base it on what the Bible says. So that's why this fourth test is, is difficult because in my case, I came to the point where I was convinced of those first three litmus tests, but I still didn't have the, the example proof to back it up. But I lived, I preached, I taught what the Bible says because that's valid theology. Now, if I've now... It, it, you know, I've been preaching this uh, for, let's see, it's been a little over three years now that I've had a healing ministry since that encounter I had way back when. If for these three years I had been preaching these things and still had never seen anybody healed through my ministry, I would probably start to question why I'm teaching what I'm teaching. Uh, just because it doesn't work immediately doesn't mean it's wrong. Uh, Usually it means we need to just press in a little further, keep hammering away at it, keep believing and persevere because Jesus does want to do what he said he would do. Uh, but yeah, after a long time, if there's no results, I mean, there's people, unfortunately, that I won't call them out, but they have, they're holding theologies that for the past several hundred years have not borne any kind of fruit of the miraculous and they still believe those theologies. That bothers me. 
especially since Jesus made it so plain and simple in the Word of God and he's offered it to us so, so openly through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then there are people, not just preachers like me, but average folks. See, when I was in Uganda the first time, and it was October of 2011, I saw God do some incredible things. But one of my favorite things to talk about is when I went and preached to a group of Kenyan school kids. There was about 300 of them. Uh, it was, we had already spent two, two weeks in Uganda and on the last day I was supposed to catch a plane in uh, Kenya and my guide, Wycliffe, took me back to his house to stay the night before going to the airport. Well, the next morning he took me to this school to preach. I preached the gospel. I said, uh, you know, I, I've met people in the past couple weeks who were thrown out of their homes, children who were thrown out of their homes because they decided to follow Jesus. I told these kids, look, I, I cannot guarantee that when you become a Christian, your whole life will get better. But I can guarantee it'll be worth it. So I gave an, a, a salvation call. I said, if you want this Jesus, you've decided that he's worth the cost, no matter what it costs you, I want you to stand. As far as I could see, all 300 students stood. Now, that was exciting enough. I had Wycliffe lead them through a prayer of salvation in their own language in Swahili. And uh, right after that, I thought of that verse from Mark, these signs will accompany those who believe. And I said to these students, how many of you would like to see what Jesus can do through you now that you believe? Now, they, were, they were at the edge of their seats, of course. So I said, uh, they were sitting, sitting down again and I said, I, I taught them briefly about Mark 16. And then I said, all right, here's all you got to do. I'm going to, whatever your problem is, whatever the person's problem is, you ask them what's the problem, they tell you, let's say it's my shoulder hurts, all right? Put your hand on their shoulder. As long as it's appropriate to put your hand there, that's what you do. If not, just, just put it on their shoulder, all right? Put your hand on their shoulder and say, shoulder be healed in Jesus' name. That's all you got to do. So that's what they did. I, I said, if you've got eye problems, ear problems, pain in your body, a sickness, a disease, and then my mistake, I said a bump, a scrape, or a bruise, which of course every kid in the room stood. So my plan to have the kids sitting pray for the ones standing wasn't going to work anymore, and instead I paired them off in, in twos. I said, all right, go for it. So they took turns. One prayed for the one, the other be healed in Jesus' name, right? And at the end of that, after about 30 seconds, I calmed it all down. Now, some of them were goofing off. Some of them were being ridiculous. But that didn't stop the power of God. See, kids don't get a junior Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't tell the disciples, these signs will accompany those who believe if they're old enough. He didn't say, these signs will accompany those who believe if they don't goof off. He simply said, they'll lay their hands on the sick and they'll recover. These kids believed Jesus. They believed the message of the gospel. They believed that Jesus paid the price, period. So, I, at the end of that 30 seconds, I said, if you can test it out and you know you're healed, maybe it's, if it was a scrape, you can see that it's healed over, whatever it is, you know you're healed, I want you to sit. If not, stay standing because we're going to pray for you again. Half of that group sat down. So, we prayed again. Half of that group sat down. Prayed again. Everybody except one boy up in the very front. And actually, when I looked at the video later, uh, no one was praying for him the second or third time. So I suddenly understood why. Well, I said to him, what, what's your problem? Uh, and he goes, my eyes, I can't read. So I put my hands on his eyes. I said, eyes be healed in Jesus' name. I opened my Bible to him and he smiled and started reading. 300 Kenyan school kids, every one of them ministering healing five minutes after coming to salvation. I only touched one of them, so it wasn't my fault. <laughs> These kids knew what the gospel is. They understood the truth of it and they believed the message that was preached. I hate to say it this way, but the truth is they hadn't heard enough sermons to stop believing that God wants to heal. They were convinced Jesus paid the price. And that's what I want to convince you of. He paid the price. So I want to look at these four litmus tests a little deeper, a little bit deeper. We've talked about what is correct healing theology. Those are the tests we're going to base it on. But let's back up to that message that agrees 100% with the entire Bible. In Isaiah 53, 5, the prophet said this about Jesus. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Jesus' blood purchased forgiveness for everyone. And that same blood purchased healing for everyone. Was anybody excluded when he paid for their forgiveness? 
See, if you're going to believe that Jesus' healing or Jesus' blood only paid for the healing of some, then you have to also believe that his blood only paid for the forgiveness of son of some. You, you can't have one and not the other. Either his blood is all sufficient or his blood is lacking. I'm convinced it's all sufficient. When we pray for healing or command it in the name of Jesus, we are simply asking for something that was already paid for. See, we're not really asking God to do something that he's already done. <laughs> Actually, that's, that's kind of what's happening. We just have to think of it that way. He's already paid for it. See, I tell people if, if I went, uh, let's say, to a Walmart, bought the biggest big screen TV they had, as if I had that kind of money. <laughs> and uh, let's say this thing cost $4,000. Well, I put down my $4,000. I can't even fit the thing in my car, so I need it shipped to my house. Go home, here come the guys, they carry the big box into my living room, set it down, they leave. I open up the box, all excited to get my giant screen TV, and the box is empty. How do you think I'm going to respond? I mean, I'm probably gonna be pretty irate, right? I paid a lot of money for that TV and I, I'm probably going to go back to the store and demand that I receive what I paid for or give me my money back. One or the other. Make up your mind. But I'm not just sitting with a $4,000 empty box in my house. Well, guess what? Jesus paid a price much higher than a measly $4,000. He paid with his own blood and he deserves to receive everything he paid for. That's why I teach what I teach. That's why I minister what I minister. It's because I'm tired of seeing Jesus missing out on the price he paid, on the reward of his suffering. Jesus' blood purchased healing for everyone. When we seek healing for someone, we're not merely asking for that person to receive something. We're also asking for Jesus to receive what he paid for. I hesitate to say this, but the truth is I, I don't have enough compassion for all the sick people on the planet. I, you know, there's, there's, there's times when I'm just spent. I, you know, I'm, I'm in Africa and I've prayed for a hundred people and I'm spent. I just can't pray for another one. But I see someone else coming up to me who's, who's you know, they're bringing their baby who has malaria. And what am I going to do? I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm spent. I'm exhausted. I want to go to bed. And in my human self, my compassion level, it's just spent. I'm running on E. But I love Jesus and that never runs out. And when I look at that baby, I see a baby that Jesus paid for. And so I go and I minister again, not because I have this amazing compassion that never runs out, because I don't. It's because I love Jesus that never runs out and I know he deserves what he paid for. He paid the $4,000 for the TV and I can't stand to just see that he's having the devil steal from him and I'm just going to walk by and pretend it never happened. See, 1 John 3, 8 says the reason the Son of God came into the world was to destroy the devil's work. That right there, devil's work. We need to destroy it because Jesus said, as the Father sent me, I send you. I hold that commission now. It's my responsibility. People ask, why do bad things happen in the world? And when they ask me, I say, because I haven't done enough to stop those things. We need to, come on church, we need to rise up and take responsibility to represent Jesus the way that he told us to represent him. If Jesus just wanted you to get saved so you could go to heaven, then when you pray the prayer of salvation, boom, you could have been just raptured right then. It would have been glorious and wonderful. But that's not how he did it. He left you here and he did it for a purpose. It's so that you can represent him in this world. Uh, healing has already been purchased. Praying for healing isn't a matter of asking God to do something that he's reluctant to do. On the contrary, it's a matter of accessing something, something that he has already purchased. Well, let's look at uh, what we can find that agrees 100% with the example of Jesus. Truth is, Jesus healed everyone who came to him. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus healed every sick person he saw. See, there were sick people he saw that he didn't heal. Um, a great example is at the Pool of Bethesda. He saw one particular man who had been an invalid, I think it was for 18 years, and uh, he went to him because he was moved with compassion. But at that Pool of Bethesda, there were all kinds of sick and lame and diseased people that were waiting for this angel to come down and trouble the waters in the pool and whoever got in the pool would be healed. But here's this guy, he's saying when the water gets troubled, uh, 
everybody else gets in before me and I've just been laying here for all these years. Jesus had compassion on him, healed him, and then snuck away into the crowd. And that's what shows us, see, Jesus was still trying to fly under the radar. He wasn't after every sick person he saw. Um, another example would be in Jesus' hometown where we have the, you know, the, the city of unbelief, we're told. Well, what we're expected to believe is that Jesus couldn't work miracles there, it says, because of their unbelief. We're expected to believe that that means the unbelief of the people was more powerful than the faith of Jesus. I mean, when you put it in those terms, does it make sense? <laughs> the captain of our salvation being unable to produce uh, the kind of faith that would overcome someone else's unbelief? See, uh, the truth is, Jesus marched into the middle of a funeral procession and raised the person from the dead. And if that's not an atmosphere of unbelief, I don't know what is. I mean, Jesus just, <laughs> he walked into a mourning group of people knowing what he carried with him, knowing what was possible, knowing he was the resurrection and the life, and he just said, hey, get up. And the young man rose. Jesus rose the, uh, raised the dead. Jesus healed every person who came to him. In fact, I, I can't find any funerals Jesus went to that he didn't mess up, including his own. <laughs> John 5, 19. Well, actually, let me back up. First of all, we have to be clear that Jesus, though he was and is 100% God, the things he did on this earth, he did as a man in right relationship with God to show us how to live. See, uh, Acts 10, 38 says that, uh, it talks about how Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. Now, it tells us right there, he did those things because God was with him. If Jesus did those things because he was God, then we don't have a responsibility to live the same. But if he did those things because God was with him, then we have a responsibility because God is with us. Is that true? Is he with you? Is God with you? If he's with you, then you have met the criteria of Acts 10.38. Uh, Philippians 2, 6 through 8 is very clear that gave, Jesus gave up everything about himself that could be considered God. And he humbled himself to the point of a servant, even to the point of dying a criminal's death on a cross. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but gave it all up. He left it all in heaven and came down, humbled himself to live like one of us. John 5, 19, Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. That's important. Jesus said the son can do nothing by himself. What's Jesus saying? He would, this may stretch your theology a little. Jesus was saying, I can't do anything by myself, guys. I can't walk on water. <laughs> I can't heal the sick. I can't raise the dead. I only do what I see my father doing. Hmm. It's a deep one to think about, but it's true of us. See, Jesus was demonstrating how we're to live. Yeah, I can't do anything except what he's revealed for me to do. And one of the things he's revealed for me to do, he said, listen, guys, this is what I'm leaving you with. My spirit is going to live in you. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses. In other words, you'll witness me wherever you go, even to the uttermost parts of the earth, you'll see me at work. And that's what we see throughout the book of Acts. That's what happened. People were healed. The dead were raised. Lepers were cleansed. The, the lives were changed. Salvation happened. Revival broke out. That's how people lived. They, the Christians carried revival with them. They were revival. They didn't wait for one to show up. They took God's presence with them wherever they went. And they revealed him in whatever way possible. Whatever opportunity there was. That's what we can do as believers. Jesus couldn't heal anyone. He said it himself, the son can do nothing by himself. Every miracle he worked was not done as God, but rather as an ordinary human being in right relationship with his father in heaven. That's why Jesus could say, the works I do, you will do also and even greater. Additionally, Jesus consistently healed everyone who came to him. Now I'm going to read to you a, a whole list of scriptures and we're just going to, one by one, I want you to see Pay close attention to the word all. Over and over, you're going to see all. Matthew 4, 24. 
news about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Matthew 8, 16, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. Matthew 9.35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Matthew 12.15, aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place, many followed him, and he healed all their sick. Matthew 14.35-36, and when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all the sick to him and begged him to let them just touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. Mark 6, 56, and wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces, they begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. Luke 4, 40, when the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Luke 6, 18b through 19, those troubled by evil spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. And Acts 10, 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Are you seeing a pattern here? I don't, I don't see one case in all these passages or, or in anywhere in the Gospels where someone came to Jesus and they said, uh, Lord, would you heal me? And he said, I'm sorry, my father's building character in you, so you're going to have to stay a leper. Does that mean that God cannot build, build character through sickness? No, I, I know plenty of people who have testimonies that through the course of their sickness, God built tremendous character in their lives. No question about that. See, God, uh, pardon the, the gambling reference, but God can win with any hand, hand he's dealt. Uh, he's that good. <laughs> he's that good. And so, uh, you know, if people's faith is at a spot where they're convinced the only purpose of this sickness is that God will change me emotionally or my character, if that's where their faith is, God will work with their faith. You know, the book of Romans chapter 12, it tells, you know, it talks about prophecy. It says, let him prophesy according to his faith. In any of the, we're talking supernatural ministry, Whatever it is, according to our faith, God's going to respond to that faith. He's going to respond to us where we are. Jesus would have gone to the centurion's servant if the centurion didn't have faith on a level that said, you don't have to come here. That's why Jesus was on the way. See, God will meet us where we are, and so he can use the, the sickness and disease that the devil has put on us to shape us and change us. I mean, look at Job. It's very clear in the book of Job that the sickness he had was the devil's work. Very clear. In fact, the devil, because of Job living in a righteous life, the devil couldn't touch him. God had placed a hedge around him. And frankly, Jesus seems to imply a similar thing about his own life. Uh, I forget where the verse is, but he said, Satan has no grip on me. Yeah. And so, uh, in fact, he said to his disciples, I've given you the authority to walk on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means harm you. Now, I know this sounds like I'm teaching some kind of hyper-faith message, but what I'm teaching you is Bible. It's what Jesus taught. It's what the Bible reveals. Yeah, God worked a lot in Job's character through the process of what happened. But God's ultimate will was revealed at the end of the book when he gave Job double what, was, what the devil had stolen from him. In fact, the book of Proverbs says that if a thief steals and he's caught stealing, he has to repay seven times. So when I, you know, had degenerative disc disease for four years, Hundreds of people prayed for me. In the midst of me having it, I was looking for ways that God could improve my character, but still knowing God wants to heal me. I prayed for myself hundreds of times. In fact, for uh, two years of my, well, a year and a half of my healing ministry, I still had degenerative disc disease and bulging discs. Yeah. And that bugged people because I'm out there preaching, Jesus wants to heal 100%, no questions asked, and I'm walking around with problems in my lower back. Yeah, but guess what? My theology is not based on my experience. My theology is based on the Word of God. And if the Word of God trumps my experience, then I've got to forget, you know, whatever disappointments I may have encountered, and I've got to believe Jesus at face value. And I was finding that it was working for everybody. It wasn't working for me yet. 
but it was working. And then in April of 2011, a year and a half after starting a healing ministry, all of a sudden, boom, instantly healed. My back was completely fine. And at the time of this recording, it's been another year and a half since then, and I've been free. There's a lot more to the story, but that's the Cliff Notes version. So, Jesus healed everyone who came to him. Was I shaped through that experience? Yes. But I, I guarantee you, God's getting a lot more glory out of the fact that I was healed than if I was still sitting here with degenerative disc disease. Jesus paid a very high price for it. He deserves what he paid for. So this is also true of the disciples. See, if, if it only happened in Jesus' life and never translated to the disciples, then we would have reason to question, well, yeah, that was Jesus, but does it really apply to us? Well, Acts 5.16 it says that crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, all of them were healed. They were bringing the sick and those tormented to the Christians. Jesus wasn't around then. Jesus had ascended into heaven. It was just the Christians meeting. And all of them were healed. Everyone. Nobody got turned away saying God's building character in you and you're not supposed to be healed. Nobody got turned away because, well, you know, it looks like it's not God's will. I mean, think about it. When the, the father brought his epileptic son to the disciples and they tried to cast out the demon, it would have been really easy them, for them, especially if they lived in our culture today, to just say, well, I'm sorry, Pop, but it looks like it's not God's will for your son to be healed. It looks like God's will is that he would have epilepsy. The Lord works in mysterious ways. Forgive the rabbit trail, but that's not in the Bible. That phrase, the Lord works in mysterious ways, not there. It comes actually from an old, an old hymn. And if you look at it in context, it says, the Lord works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. So the original context of that phrase was not to, to put a wet blanket on faith, but instead to say, Look, God is a miracle-working God, and he's, he's mysterious in the amazing things he can do. Somehow the devil hijacked that line. If people just look at you because, you know, someone's sick and they didn't get healed, and they say, well, brother, the Lord works in mysterious ways, tell them, no, that's not in my Bible, and I, I challenge you to find it in yours. It's not there. It's not there. Well, the disciples were doing the work, too. And now... The beauty of this, it's not just stuck in the Bible pages, it's also here in our own lives. We're starting to see it happen. 300 Kenyan school kids have seen it happen. God uses the average everyday believer, those who will believe him, who will take him at his word and believe Jesus paid the price 100%. He uses it. And we've been seeing lots of healing happening. I'm not batting 100% all the time, but I, I can tell you the truth. I've been in a number of meetings now where every single person received healing. Not because I laid hands on all of them, but because 300 Kenyan school kids did, because a, a church of young and old alike all worked together and made it happen. I was in one church where a little old lady, after the meeting, she, she saw several people healed. She went home and prayed for her son who was bedridden, and he got up. Yeah, God's doing incredible things throughout the earth, and he's doing it through average Christians like you and me. Third, let's look at what matters of healing theology agree 100% with the nature of God. One of God's names revealed in Exodus 15.26 is Jehovah Rophi or Jehovah Rapha. Um, and some people like Yahweh Rophi, Yahweh Rapha. I'm just going to say Jehovah Rapha because that's the one that I grew up with. Uh, but however you pronounce the Hebrew word, here's what it means. The Lord who heals you. So, healing is a part of God's name and is therefore part of his nature. See, one of God's uh, names uh, was also Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Now, let me ask you some, some questions here. Is God ever unrighteous? No, no. Does his righteousness have limits? No. Is his righteousness available to only some or is it available to all? all. Is it sometimes available or always available? Yeah, always. Now, God is also called Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. So, does his peace have limits? Uh, is his peace available only to some or to all who receive him? Uh, is his peace sometimes available or always available? He's called Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. 
Is he ever not there? I think you're getting the idea here. See, Jehovah Sidkenu is always making righteousness available to us. Jehovah Shalom is always making peace available to us. Jehovah Shema is always present with us. And Jehovah Rofi, Jehovah Rapha, is always making healing available to us. It's his nature. It's what pours out of him. He can't do anything other than that. It's who he is. It's his identity. So, he's not the God who sometimes heals. He is the God who heals, period. Since this is a part of his nature, it's something that naturally flows from him. Healing has been purchased for everyone once and for all. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that absolutely anyone can be healed by the Lord our healer. It is his nature, and we've been given access to this nature through knowing Christ, because 2 Peter 1.4 says that through knowing Christ, uh, through God's glory, and it produces God's glory and goodness, right? And, and God's glory and goodness has given us every has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in this world caused by evil desires. That's exciting. You and I, we, we are not God, but he invites us. God invites us to participate in his nature. And since he is the Lord, our healer, he then says to his disciples in Matthew 10, heal the sick. He didn't say, go out, ask my father to heal the sick, ask my father to raise the dead, ask my father to cleanse lepers, and ask my father to cast out demons. He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. When, when Peter and John were at the gate called Beautiful in the temple, and there was the man that had been begging there, uh, and Peter came up and said, look, I don't have silver or gold, but what I have I give you, rise up and walk. So he was giving the man something he had. And yet later when he was being questioned, Peter said, why do you look at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? But it's by faith in Jesus and the, it's the name of Jesus and faith that comes through him that's made this man well, as you can plainly see. So Peter was saying in one setting, this is something I have that I'm giving. Remember Jesus said, Matthew 10, freely you've received, freely give, heal the sick. But he was also saying, look, I, I don't technically actually have anything. It's like Jesus said, the son can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees the father doing. Our father for the last 2,000 years has been healing and he's been in the healing business and I don't expect him to stop because this is his nature, it's who he is, and it's what he does. Even in the Old Testament, Psalm 103, David had a revelation of God's desire for healing and that's why he said in verse 3, he forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. So in other words, it's not, not only is healing part of God's nature, but through knowing Christ, his healing power naturally becomes part of our own nature because we're participating in his divine nature. And that's why it's possible for Christians to not only pray for healing, but also to command healing. Be healed in Jesus' name. We're allowed to say that because Jesus commissioned us to say that, and we participate in his nature. So now, for the fourth measuring rod, does it work? Well, uh, I'm living proof. I can assure you it does work. Everything I've just described does indeed work. By putting this particular theology into practice through relationship with Jesus Christ, I, I have seen people healed of all kinds of things. I, I have seen deaf ears open on multiple occasions. I've seen blind eyes open on multiple occasions. Uh, cripples walking. I, I had a woman who was lame for 10 years in Uganda and she came forward and said, I, I've been lame 10 years and now I'm walking and I just have a little back pain. So we prayed for her back pain and that left completely in Jesus' name. Uh, I've seen tumors disappear. I've seen uh, uh, babies with malaria healed. Uh, just the other day I saw a baby with cradle cap healed. It was yesterday. Cradle cap. I mean, I... I don't see a reason why God wouldn't heal that, but it was, it was just a first for me. And I'm, I'm, I love discovering what God can do. I've, I saw a woman who had been in a car accident and she had had, uh, she, in her words, she said, I have a problem with every vertebrae in my back. I don't know if she was exaggerating or what, but that's how she put it. And she said, for 10 years, I've been suffering with this. I started to pray for her and she said, I, I don't feel any change, but I feel like something's happening. So I said, all right, wait here. I'm going to pray for someone else. Prayed for someone else. That woman got healed. When I came back to the woman from the car accident, she was shaking and her son is, who's like, I think he was in his 30s, her son is bawling his eyes out because his mom is bending and moving her neck and, and twisting around. She didn't have that kind of motion for 10 years and God healed her. I didn't even, I wasn't even there for it. I walked away while God did the work. 
And I'm also seeing cases where kids are doing the ministry. There was one church in, in Uganda in a village called Isagero where I felt like the Holy Spirit told me, don't even preach, just invite me to come and, and I'm going to do this. So I did and we waited. For five minutes, we waited, nothing was happening, and all of a sudden, people started to weep in repentance, and some started to come to salvation. Somebody said, I'm healed, and, and before you knew it, there were several people, and we, we said, "If once you're healed, come to the front, and the, the front of the church filled up with people that had been healed, and then we opened it up. We said, is there anyone out there who still has not received healing, and a, a few hands went up. I said to the kids who were present, because I didn't want to mess it up, I said, kids, you go, find someone with their hand up, put your hand on them, say, be healed in Jesus' name and go to the next person. Just, just keep going. And one by one, they went around to these different people, be healed in Jesus' name, be healed in Jesus' name. Every person in that meeting was healed. Our God is in the healing business. This theology works. We've seen cases where 100% in the meeting are healed. Now, asking why are some people not healed? Chances are every answer you've ever received from that came from people's speculation rather than from the Bible. See, the Bible only gives us one instance where a person was not healed and a reason was given for it. And that was where uh, the, the disciples tried to cast the spirit out of the epileptic boy and it didn't work. And then the boy was brought to Jesus and it did work. It's a good thing those disciples didn't say, I'm sorry, it looks like it's not God's will. <laughs> well, <clears throat> they, uh, they brought the boy to Jesus he said, uh, you know, why do I have to put up with the, how long will I have to put up with this unbelieving generation? He cast out the demon with a shriek, gone, boom, threw the boy on the floor, and the boy was completely healed. Now, after the fact, the disciples came to Jesus and said, why couldn't we cast out the spirit? This has become my pattern. If I pray for a person and they do not receive healing, I can't blame that person. Because I've seen a lot of people healed who had no faith for themselves. I've seen it a lot of times. In fact, most people I pray for, since I do a lot out on the street with people who aren't even Christians, they don't have faith. If they had faith, they'd be Christians. So I pray for a lot of people who have no faith for themselves. They're not even expecting anything to work, uh, and yet God heals them. Boom. So I can't blame the person for their lack of faith. I can't even blame the onlookers. See, remember I started mentioning the city of unbelief. Uh, really, if you think about it, the city of unbelief, the, the city of Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, their unbelief did not trump Jesus' faith. That's not the case. It tells us why no one was healed. It tells us what their unbelief was. It says that they started to look at Jesus and say, isn't this Mary's son? It's interesting, they weren't even saying, isn't this Joseph's son? Because they knew this is that kid who Mary claimed, I've never been with a man, but now I'm having a baby, and so, yeah, here's that illegitimate child again, and, and yeah, he was a carpenter. He's just an ordinary guy. Their mindset went from heavenly mindedness down to earthly mindedness, and they did not see Jesus for who he was. And I'm convinced that they, for that reason, didn't even see a reason to go to him. If you don't see any value in a person, if you don't see that they have anything to offer you, you're not even going to go to them to give you what you don't expect that they have. My, my understanding of that scripture is they just walked away because they were, you know, like, he's got nothing to offer me. And so because of their unbelief, he was only, to heal, only able to heal a few sick people. Now, it's interesting. That right there proves that Jesus' healing anointing was not shut down. Personally, this is, this is me reading between the lines and extrapolating, but if you look at the Greek word for sick, it actually means weak and infirmed. So I personally like to think that the reason that those were the only healings Jesus was able to work was because they were the only ones weak enough that they couldn't get away from him. <laughs> they were the only ones who couldn't walk away. That may be wrong interpretation, but I like it because I've seen a lot of people healed who had no faith for themselves. So, uh, yeah, does it work in practice? Absolutely. Absolutely. As I mentioned before, the fact that it works doesn't mean that it's perfect. Uh, it doesn't mean that my theology is perfect. But if it didn't work, then I'd have reason to, I, I would have no reason to share all this with you. If I wasn't seeing this work, this would just be a waste of all of our time. But if I am seeing it work, if I am seeing results and I'm seeing Jesus receive what he paid for all over the world, not just in, in normal context. In fact, it's, I can guarantee it's not even just psychology because I've prayed for people in the bush of Uganda who do not speak English. And through a translator, and you know, I'm casting out a demon out of this person. The translator's not translating what I'm saying to the demon. 
I'm telling the thing to leave and everything I'm telling the demon to do, the woman is saying, this is what's happening to me. She's telling my translator and he's telling me, the demon understands English, but she didn't. And she was responding to what I was saying, even though she didn't know what I was saying. So I know it's not psychology. I know that was a demon responding to what the Holy Spirit was speaking in that moment. And so finally the demon left, the woman was completely set free. It was uh, the problem she was having, if I remember right, was pain in both her legs. And uh, it shifted over to one, then shifted back to the other. And anytime pain starts moving around, that's when I instantly know we're, it's time we're probably dealing with a demon. So then we start casting out the spirit of infirmity. I mean, it's, it's a pretty easy one. You don't even have to have discernment for that. People tell you, well, the pain moved. Instantly, spirit of infirmity, leave in Jesus' name. Uh, it's, it's just my go-to now. And we've seen results with that. We're seeing results. And I hope and pray that this multiplies through this video to you, that you'll start seeing results, that you'll take Jesus at his word, you'll believe him. You'll take him at face value, that what he says goes. Uh, I would love to, to share with you more and more and more, but, but for the sake of this teaching, I want to keep it focused on that solid level of healing theology. Maybe in another teaching we'll talk about, you know, how do we know it's always God's will to heal people. Uh, but for right now, I want to assure you that it is. It is, it is, it is. There's, back, there's Bible to back it up. There's experience to back it up. And hopefully you're going to discover that that experience is now your experience. Go. Lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Simply believe Jesus. Just go, whatever their problem is, put your hand there, say, you know, if it's their back, back, be healed in Jesus' name. It's, it's not a method. Jesus never healed two blind people the same way. I just like to give people a default because sometimes we get there, we aren't sure what we're supposed to say, so we don't say anything at all. There's your default. Now follow the Holy Spirit. If all of a sudden you feel like you're supposed to speak life into the discs in that person's back, then do that. Discs be filled with fluid in Jesus' name. Nerves be released in Jesus' name. Swelling go in Jesus' name. Muscles be strengthened in Jesus' name. These things may come to you. If they do, it's probably God. If they don't, you don't need to say it. It's not a formula. It's all about just following Jesus and believing him for who he is. Doing the same things that he did. Doing the same thing that the disciples did. You are that disciple of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for every person watching this video that you, Lord, would open up new realms of your presence, of your power. Lord, demonstrate through them what you made available through Christ. Lord, I ask that you would blow the doors off of their ministry time, that they would see waitresses in restaurants, uh, co-workers, uh, employers even, people who they meet in the grocery store, that they recognize this person needs a touch from God and they would speak to it in Jesus' name. Lord, fill your people with boldness from your spirit. Fill them with power from your spirit. Let us, Lord, be an army who goes out in your life, in your power, in your joy, in your love, and represents you in everything. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.